Good evening, and thank you uh, for being here for another Pizza and Politics uh, event. We appreciate you coming out on this beautiful spring night. I'd like to maybe start out by th making a special thanks to the chancellor of SIU, John Dunn, who's come over to uh, listen in. He was very gracious to meet with the representative upon her arrival. So thanks very much, Chancellor, for being here. I had the good fortune to meet um, our speaker uh, last fall. We were having our Metro East event um, in East St. Louis, and um, it was you know in October, so the campaign was sort of in full, full force. And we had this event with uh, young high school men from the East St. Louis Metro um, East area. So uh, we we're you know we're, I think we we're just about ready to break for lunch, and uh, Representative Greenwood came through. She she went off the campaign trail to make a special visit to our event and work the room, was talking with all the students and shaking hands and, and smiling and just interacting with them in a way that was very uh, easy and comfortable. And as we were leaving, I was talking to my colleague, Linda Baker, and I said, we need to bring her in town for a pizza and politics event. Um, the representative has SIU roots from the Edwards uh, Will, uh, Will branch of the family. So, but she's from East St. Louis. Um, grew up there, had, uh, went to Michigan State University for an undergraduate, and then picked, earned a master's in public administration from SIU Edwardsville. She returned back to her community. She's been active in the East St. Louis City Council, uh, was worked in the schools and, in East St. Louis, and won, won the uh, 114th Legislative District in 2016. Um, and has been emerged as one of the stars in Springfield. So it's going to give us a sense of, of just some of the things that are going on in Springfield. Obviously, there's new energy and new activity uh, since uh, January when there's united government in, in Springfield. So she's going to give us some of her perspectives on what is happening in Springfield. Um, and then I'm going to have a, just a brief conversation with her back and forth. And then we're going to open it up to all of you where we want to spend the bulk of the time hearing your questions. and. Uh, and so forth. So with that, I'd like to represent Latoya Greenwood to come forward and speak. So, Representative. Thank you. No, I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to uh, Chancellor Dunn for your gracious welcome. Thank you to uh, Dr. Baker for uh, inviting me, and Mr. Shaw, thank you so much. Well, you learned a little bit about me. Yes, I'm from East St. Louis. I still call East St. Louis my home. Um, I am a mother. I'm the mother to one son. His name is Nicholas. He's a junior at uh, Altoff Catholic High School in Belleville. And I guess maybe I should start by saying, are there any East St. Louisans here? All right. I need you guys closer to me for that East St. Louis energy. And just some icebreakers like, do we have any Catholic school kids here? I was a Catholic school. Let's raise our hands. And how many of you voted in the last election? All right. OK, so I'm amongst the good crowd here today. So I am, um, like I said, a lifelong resident of East St. Louis. Prior to um, me coming here, very active in uh, East St. Louis politics. My father uh, is still um, a politician, although I hope he's retiring soon. <laughs> um, me and the chancellor talked about his years on the local school board, and my father has probably, I think, over 20 years on our local school board. So hopefully he will be slowing down. Other than him, um, the lady, the honorable representative who held my seat prior to Representative Eddie Jackson was Yvette Young. And um, I had the awesome opportunity to hear and meet her when I was a student at St. Joseph Catholic School. I was probably around the sixth or seventh grade and she came to my school and uh, she, she talked to the student. It was like an assembly. And from that moment on, I remember telling all my friends, like, I want to be just like her. I want to be just like her. I mean, here this woman was. She was still living in East St. Louis. She was an attorney. She was accomplished. She was smart. She was 
going to Springfield and working on our behalf. And she also did something that I will never forget. Um, our principal at the time, and you think about it now, well, she was well ahead of her years in terms of having students like us uh, deal with issues surrounding social justice issues, um, issues in our community and making us active and aware. And so we would write letters. That was one of the class projects while you're learning English and history and just cultural things about your community, we would write letters not only to our representative, but also to our mayor. So I remember receiving a, a letter back from my mayor at the time, which was Carl Officer. He wrote, it was like an issue with some potholes near our school. And he wrote me back, that was one of my very first letters of what I call social activism <laughs> at work. And my second letter came from Representative Young. And I just will never forget it that she took the time um, out of her schedule to contact uh, just a student like me to respond back. So I think it's very important that we as public officials and elected officials always stay engaged with our community, in particular with our youth, and let them know that we are accessible, we're humans, we are people just like all of you, and uh, sometimes I think people forget that, that we have feelings too, but that's another conversation. <laughs> also, I had the awesome opportunity um, to be a delegate for Hillary Clinton when she ran for president. Um, and it really was one of those life-changing moments for me. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Philadelphia and participate in that democratic process and to see and hear firsthand about a woman with the strong possibility of being president of the United States. And I still consider that one of the uh, most extreme honors that I could have in my political career. And when we talk about women in politics, so much has changed. Um, we look at the city of Chicago and we see all of those women and in particular they have quite a few women of color that are doing some amazing things or will be doing some amazing things in Chicago. Um, one is my colleague and one of my very dearest friends, Melissa Conyers Irving, who was just elected as the city treasurer for Chicago. And I want to give her a clap. We're so proud of her. And of all the women, um, I've had the opportunity not to meet uh, the new mayor, but I had the opportunity to meet Tony Perkwinkle at some point, and she was awesome and amazing. So I think that uh, Chicago is definitely a city that we should be watching to see all of the, ho hopefully, and but I know, amazing things that will happen um, from the women in power there. So, um, as state representative, I sit on um, some different caucuses. One is the Women's Caucus of the, the House of Representatives. Um, I am the secretary, and they call that a leadership position. And we've done some amazing things in the Women's Caucus, in particular highlighting and bringing um, light to issues that affect women. Um, we've talked about sexual harassment, which in that case, we've increased our training and workshops that we've had at the state level. And we're focusing on legislation that um, is focused toward women's issues and hoping to push those to the forefront so that all women and really all residents of Illinois just recognize and understand that the power of women and the issues that we have. Um, another caucus that I'm a participant in is the Black Caucus. And we have a House Black Caucus as well as a Joint Black Caucus, which is with the Senate. And in the Joint Black Caucus, I'm the secretary, and that's a leadership position. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. They're always like, Latoya, where are the notes? I don't, I'm not used to keeping notes, but I try my best. But um, <laughs> so um, those issues that we focus on are uh, communities uh, like minority communities that some of us represent. But what we find, even in the Black Caucus, as we do in the House in general, is that even amongst us, they, there are certain priorities that each of us have. So uh, my priority may be um, affordable housing, which it is. Uh, Representative Will Gazzardi has an uh, amazing house resolution that he just put out about $1 billion for affordable housing. And um, I'm just very excited about that. But some of us don't um, represent just primarily uh, minority communities. Some of the members of, of the Black Caucus represent uh, communities that have high percentage of Latinos and or um, uh, white communities that they represent. So I happen to represent, I think my, my makeup is around 60 or 70% and uh, the, the remainder is 30%, uh, maybe Caucasian or other. So um, I have uh, East St. Louis and Washington Park, Cahokia, Centerville, Allerton. And then I have Belleville, Lebanon, O'Fallon, parts of uh, Lebanon, Freeburg, Muscoota, Millstadt, and I'm missing some, Smithton. And so um, it's a vast district with plenty of um, diversity, with plenty of issues that people may consider their priority. And I hope that in the end, I think common issues that we all have in common, no matter where you live, it's about education, it's about job creation, it's about affordable homes, and it's about a safe and healthy community. And I rarely find in between things that people find more um, important than those four issues. So those are some of the issues that I try to stick to. I'm also on the House uh, Democratic budget team. And I was on there last year also. And um, this year, uh, under Governor Pritzker, we, have, we still have challenges to face as a state. Um, we have billions of dollars in uh, debt that we still owe. We have um, some, quite a few different options that people are thinking about. Do we have any supporters of recreational marijuana here? Okay. So see, I can take that back. <laughs> <laughs> look, <laughs> you can't raise your hand, okay. <laughs> so look, that's, that's something I'll take back. <laughs> and then we have uh, a fair tax, uh, the fair tax proposal. Do we have any supporters of that here? Okay, I'll take that back. And so um, just trying to figure it all out, um, how we um, bring in more revenue. And how do we balance spending for on services that we really need? Um, during when we had a, a budget crisis, there were some things that really were affected. One was higher education, um, the way it was funded. It was a, a lot of money that was not sent to higher education. Another was social service uh, agencies and facilities. And so now we have to try to figure out how do we balance that. And so that's one of the, the challenges that we'll face. And we don't have a lot of time to figure it out because we are scheduled to be out of session at the end of May. So um, the conversations are ongoing. And we'll see how everything pans out on that. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, one of the issues that I've been focused on this legislative session deals with maternal mortality and infant mortality. And um, I've had the absolute honor to work with Representative Mary Flowers on this issue. Um, she has been relentless, and I've just kind of been along for the ride and 
learning and understanding more about this issue. Um, she held uh, several uh, committee hearings over the summer, which really got me going. I went to Chicago, learned more about it. It was panels. And to hear these women's stories about, and it's all women um, that are dying and losing their lives, and so to be to have the opportunity to address that issue and to come up with legislation um, to be able to deal with that, that's really been an honor this legislative session. Um, as well as doing some things for um, DCFS and getting some money to those agencies that assist DCFS with abused children. Um, being able to do that has been an honor also, as well as getting money to uh, education. I serve on the Appropriations Committee for K through 12. I'm the vice chair, and so that's been a priority for me since I was sworn in um, two year, three, three years ago now, I think, since I was first sworn in. And so, um, and getting money to our higher ed is a priority as well, and keeping our students here, keeping our kids here. I was just telling the chancellor earlier, my son is a junior, we'll start looking at colleges, and he has some Illinois schools on his list, and we'll make sure Carbondale is on his list as well. So yeah, I look forward to it. Um, just in, in closing, I'm just so happy again to be here. To me, I was telling my friends, I was teasing them because I love uh, TED Talks. And I'm like, this is my like audition for TED Talks. <laughs> and <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here. I love politics and I love pizza and thank you for having me. <laughs> This will be my audition for Meet the Press. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Representative, you, you okay, mentioned the, you. the Women's Caucus that you're part of. Tell us a little bit about, does it include both Democrats and Republicans? And there's, is there, in addition to just women's issues, do you also try to branch out and talk about you know, housing, education, mm -hmm. the budget? How, how does that work? And yes, so the, the Illinois House Democratic Women's Caucus. That's what I belong to. And we also have a women's organization, COW, which is bipartisan. And um, it includes both House and Senate uh, women representatives in COW of both parties. So, yeah. But we do focus on issues, all issues, that affect really families across the state of Illinois. Um, we have made the issue about harassment and dealing with those issues a priority from some of the um, things that came out last session. And so this session, we have quite a few pieces of legislation that we'll be supporting as a caucus that's varied from housing, like you said, to uh, health care, to education. So it's a variety of everything that is a priority for that member, we try to at least take up one of those topics as a caucus. In terms of the budget, as we read about Springfield from Carbondale, it seems like the budget is the, the dominant issue now. I mean, how do you see events folding, unfolding over the next six weeks or so between now and the end of May? Mm -hmm. What are the big decisions that have to be made and where do you think the decisions are moving toward? Well, um, the decisions will be moving fast. Um, we started, um, the budget meetings that I participate in probably started three weeks ago. We meet every Wednesday at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and now meetings are taking place between appropriation committees. So each appropriation committee will um, go through they're given a certain amount that you cannot exceed uh, and go through that budget line item and try to come up with that, that amount. Um, and we're trying to get to a balanced budget. And this includes, I sit on one of the, well, sit two appropriations, public safety as well. But um, 
these committees are made up of all the, the members, so it's Republican and Democrat. And the first meeting that I went to, and we could just go through each line item and see, hey, well, what is that? Because everybody, we don't know all the line items. The budget is like this huge, huge document. And so we're working with just the appropriations budget for that particular issue. And so you say, like, what is that? And well, it may have been increased or decreased in the governor's budget, and then you want to know why or who does it impact. Um, and so it's a very tedious and long process. But I say that, but then at the same time, you only have so many weeks left to until the end of, uh, of May. And I think the deadline is around the first week in May or the second week in May that we want to have something that's kind of concrete. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. In terms of just the overall spirit in Springfield, do you get the sense, are the two parties working together, or have the Republicans, is it their view, since Democrats control both branches of government, it's sort of your job to make decisions, and they're kind of holding back? Or do you see, is there legitimate and genuine bipartisan negotiations occurring now? What's... Um, I think um, from the meetings that, that I've had, um, especially with our Appropriations Committee, there has been genuine uh, dialogue between both parties as to, we're trying to understand just like they are, those line items that's in their budget to try to figure out what, what can be cut or what can be added to or what's important in your community. Um, so we have to have those conversations so that we know that um, in a particular district, this is what's important for my community. Um, you will not know that unless you have conversations. So I, I talk to everybody, all my colleagues, to, because I want them to understand where I'm coming from and the 114th district, and I want to know more about the constituents that they represent as well. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, let me turn it over to you, and please feel free to ask Representative any questions you might. Uh, and I'll let you recognize. The Hello. It takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. to be in your spot, mm -hmm. uh, even though you're the majority party. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, rank yourself in terms of courage to refrain from programming all kinds of things and staying within a budget rather than just increasing taxes and going for the wind. Right. So I have, it seems like everything that you want to do costs money. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell, <laughs> And it's so funny you say that because some of my Republican colleagues, they're like, there you go again, trying to spend some money. And I'm, I'm like, well, if sometimes if you want to reverse things, and I tell them this all the time when we talk about uh, disproportionate uh, education and education or this cycle of poverty, I don't know how you break a cycle of poverty without investing some kind of dollars into those systems. Those systems like education or those systems like social service agencies. And so it's a balance. Um, and that's where we're trying to, to get to. I like to have that kind of dialogue to say, I'm, I live in East St. Louis, and so I know about um, our pension issue, which is huge all across the state. Or I know about um, our education system. When our superintendent came to testify and he said, he quoted like the number we spend per pupil versus the average in the state of Illinois. And so it's those things that without money invested in it, it just continues to, to perpetuate a, a cycle of uh, inequity or inadequacy. 
And, and so I think those conversations are very important, but you're right, you do have to have discipline too. So when I talked about that billion dollar affordable housing, those are the things I get excited about because housing uh, is very important in communities like East St. Louis, but not just East St. Louis, some of our rural communities as well need affordable housing. So um, it is a balance and it's a struggle. And I do, I am disciplined, but I still like to say, hey, wouldn't that billion dollars be great? <laughs> but I don't think we'll get that. <laughs> but you're not, you're not inclined mm -hmm. to cut rather than increase taxes. Right. Um, we know that uh, uh, increase to taxes in some areas is just not the way to go. Um, polling tells you that. So I know when I knock on doors, a lot of people do not want uh, an increase to their taxes. Um, so we will have to see what kind of compromise comes out of, of this whole arrangement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, have, I have another quick one. Uh -huh. Can I go ahead? Uh, I know you have a graduate, your graduate of SIUE. Yes. We've had a lot of fun here over the oh last Oh my goodness. Years. Don't you know I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it absolutely essential that Belleville get uh, a divorce? <laughs> uh, uh, Edwardsville. Edwardsville get a divorce from SIU, in your opinion. Is it really important to, to uh, Edwardsville? I don't know about that. I think some things you do to just try to start a conversation and get everybody back at the table again to start over. So hopefully we can start it over and get to building a cohesive system. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Yay. However, let me <laughs> say that story of you being taught by the nuns and getting engaged in social justice early, that story needs to be told. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Sister Carmen Marie. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I was uh, thinking of is that, you know, we have all these uh, global information systems. I mm -hmm. did some major, I don't know if it's major yet on our campus, but what they do is they look at population dynamics and public health issues and map it out. And, uh, oh yeah, say, say you has a school of public health now. I, I just realized that. But anyway, uh, do you think that those kind of findings are helpful when you're talking to your colleagues about appropriations? And uh, these are the counties where maternal health is mm -hmm. at risk. And mm -hmm. when we have babies at risk and they come into the ER, and the, the hospitals, they, they, they swallow it, mm -hmm. basically, the, all the costs. And I, I know that because I, I used to work for SIH, which is the local health mm -hmm. system, for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we, we were always trying to, you know, like, keep our budget slim so we had more buffering there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was, um, and I think what I, I saw from the legislative side was that the, there was a tendency to turn the people who are in need on each other so that that squabbling will distract from the inability to get the job done. And uh, what, what do you think, is there a tendency like that in, in the legislature in the assembly? Well, what, when we were dealing with the, uh, having our hearings, we had panels that included hospitals, uh, clinics, doctors, nurses, as well as the mothers or families who had experienced the loss. And those women that testified were very diverse in their economic status, uh, race, age, uh, but did, they wanted to come and share their story of what happened um, to them and to hopefully help other women and to help the state of Illinois get back on track in, in the way that we handle these maternal um, issues. Um, I have a safety net hospital that's in my district, which is Touche Regional Hospital. 
And uh, they, uh, we recently talked, well, Saturday I met with some of the workers, the union workers there, and they talked about uh, the issue of um, who comes to the hospital, uh, the low rate of um, intake patients that they have. And I think a lot of it is based on uh, the perception of the location of where it's at. It's in Centerville, Illinois. And when you have brand new facilities that's in uh, Belleville or O'Fallon, or we can go right across the river to St. Louis to Borns Jewish Hospital. So it's um, the issue of health care availability and accessibility is one of uh, great importance in the legislature. We do look at uh, line items for that, in particular when we're dealing with the issue of Medicaid and, and all of those things that surround Medicaid from the federal level, how it trickles down to the state level, and then how it impacts all of us in terms of the access or the health care that we get. Um, so it's an issue that we deal with and um, it's very important to everyone. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. And I'm from Belleville, so I appreciate it. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, you mentioned a little bit about um, discussing harassment um, in, in the legislature. Do you think there's been a cultural shift since the Me Too movement? Do you feel like things are, are different? Yes, I think so. We have uh, undergone a lot of training and, and different workshops. So I think sometimes people do not know behavior if, if you're used to a certain culture. And so it had to be introduced that, you know, the things that are not acceptable or um, so I think it has changed. For the better, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, if you've ever uh, had kids come in at 8 o'clock classes in the morning stoned, <laughs> you, you don't think that recreational. Oh, that's why you didn't it. raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> it, it's benign. Okay. Uh, how do you, most of the discussion seems that that's on a roll uh, because it'll help the budget. Mm -hmm. How do you think it's going to play out? We will have to see. Um, there's quite a few legislators, both Democrat and Republican, who have uh, signed on to a piece of legislation, Representative Moylan, who says just that, slow this thing down, slow this train down with recreational marijuana. So it's not a done deal yet. Um, there's still some conversations that need to happen. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you. I don't envy your job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the public side of education. Okay. Retired teacher, school mm -hmm. principal, and school district superintendent. Mm -hmm. I served at Marissa, St. Clair County. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Where you are. And I guess I'm representing the Illinois Retired Teacher Association. <laughs> Kind of represents seven counties, mm -hmm. and we're very concerned about the funding for TRS, mm -hmm. the governor's new budget. Mm -hmm. I think it's five hundred and seventy-six million underfunded. Oh, okay. And that's you know, the real issue with our pensions. Yeah. And I don't think the Chicago teachers' pension was cut. Mm -hmm. you can check that out, but I mean, I don't think it has been. So well, I have been on record many, many times. Whatever a uh, retirement that individuals have worked for, they are entitled to it. Um, there should not be any uh, cuts in that area. And uh, to give people the, the things that they work for, that they were promised at the beginning of service, I, I totally believe in that. So I'll follow up on that issue. You know, it's, people are concerned with their pensions. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> Very volatile. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of the reason you can't get new teachers in the profession. Oh, that's... I mean, I'm just... That, I'm talking to myself. Now. Yeah. There, but that's, you know, I'm happy you brought that up. Uh, there, That's another priority. There are uh, several pieces of legislation that 
deal with uh, ways to increase uh, teacher enrollment in teacher educator programs. Um, I think there's legislation that looks even at the testing in particular programs, looking at reciprocity between different states. It's, it's hard trying to get certified in Illinois. And uh, yeah, exactly. So, and you know, that's a good thing because we know our teachers are the best. And, but then it could be a bad thing from, for teachers who are coming from other states who have a history of teaching. And then you come here and it's like a roadblock in trying to get your certification. So those are some of the uh, legislation. You'll see legislation to address those issues to try to reduce the barrier. You always have to be cognizant of what everybody else is doing around Oh, around yes. The states, and that's on all of those issues. So. And I think that there is um, legislation that talks more about the Grow Your Own Teacher programs, um, even starting uh, a pipeline like in middle and high school uh, for for students that's interested in going into teaching. So programs like that, we need them to keep our teachers. Yes, ma'am. On ma the other side, um, I'm just a taxpayer. I don't have a state pension of any kind, uh, teachers or otherwise. My concern is if you have people who have not had the benefit of that, and they're the ones who are now supporting, are required to pay for the pensions, all the pensions. And you can move, as a friend of mine recently did, oh. move across the state line mm -hmm. and change your tax situation considerably by moving 50, 60 miles. If we continue to be take so much money for the pensions that we can't fund education, mm. we can't fund health care. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does that play out in your head? Because clearly there has been an exodus, which I think is more for the pro based on the fights mm -hmm. that we're having than this, but clearly that's involved. So where does that then play into what you're doing? Um, though, that's a question that we've heard many times in some of our caucuses. Uh, the governor has proposed a pension proposal, and I believe it's still in the uh, being worked through to try to get to a place because it will not be what everyone wants it to be. There will be, it'll have to take a ba some balance to get to where we need to to be, but the pension issue is a huge thing. Um, and it's just an unfortunate situation that we, we are here now with that pension situation. And I really don't have a clear explanation on how we can get out of it because it's so big and it's so uh, uh, a moving entity all of it, all by itself. So, um, again, it seems if, if that's not addressed, if, mm -hmm. if, if the people that are in power don't get their handle on the whole package, oh, yeah, then we're just repeating ourselves over and over again. And so, um, one of the proposals uh, that I've heard that people are not uh, wrapping their arms around because it sounds a little bit more like it's still not addressing the issue. Um, it's still like putting the issue of the pension off for uh, some more years instead of dealing with it now. Um, so it's still a work in progress and hopefully we'll get to some kind of resolve that all the constituents will be able to understand. Yeah. Yes, sir. Be a little, a little closer to you. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Pension's a tough question, but I, w I would add, it seems like we're looking for an instant solution, and we didn't get to here instantly to this point. But yes. But I would rather, IEA came out today, sent me an email. I'm, I'm a current teacher. I hope to be joining <laughs> soon, but um, House Bill 350 to repeal 3%. Oh, yeah. The other things that are in, in that bill. Mm -hmm. um, here in Southern Illinois, our Republican representatives and senators have all signed on as co-sponsors, mm -hmm. and IEA has sent an action alert today. Call 
and get this brought to the floor. Mm -hmm. I don't think my representative, Dave Severn, is going to have a lot of impact with Mike Madigan on getting a call to the floor. Mm -hmm. What should we do? What can we do to get Mr. Madigan to call that? You have to um, talk to the sponsors. I think I'm a sponsor of that legislation. Exactly. Yeah, it's so many legis pieces, but I think I am. Um, but get all the sponsors and come and advocate. Of course, we will advocate. Um, we've signed on to it. Uh, Speaker Madigan know that's a, a bill that's out there. So, yeah, just continue to advocate. Yep. So what, what is the bill yep. that you're talking about? The House Bill 3 350. Um, is who's the Chief sponsor on that. I'll have to look it up. Senate bill. But it deals with in last year's budget, the three percent was repealed six percent was repealed down to three percent. And so this bill increases it back to six percent for the retirement. It's a it's a cap, the three percent have, mm -hmm. even if I became a principal or changed jobs or got an advanced degree, mm -hmm. I could make no more than 3% right. of an increase. Okay. And people are just not going to take, right. for example, a principal job for a 3% rate. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's, it's Willis, okay. This is about raises, not about pensions? Well, it can affect your pension, yeah. It's to try to control the... Right. The, the giant leaps of the last few years, and then the pension becomes so high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. The governor's budget mm -hmm. um, is predicated on a fair amount of revenue increase on yeah. the balance it. Mm -hmm. What happens if the revenue increases aren't approved? Right. Where do the cuts come in the budget? Exactly. That's... One of the questions we've heard many times in caucus. Um, and like I said, it's still being worked out. Um, until we get to a final place, we won't know where the, the cuts will come. That's where the different appropriation meetings are. Um, that's what we're discussing in those. That's what we're discussing in our regular budget meeting. Then there's a budget meeting with uh, leaders of the Senate and the House, and then there's a budget meeting with leaders of House, I mean, Democrats and Republicans. So hopefully with all these meetings, we'll come to it as well as with the governor's team. We've met with the governor's team on numerous occasions, and questions like that sometimes, you know, people don't like to hear questions like that, like what happens, what if this does not happen? But um, hopefully we'll come to some kind of resolve to find out. Everything is just kind of, I can't give definite answers because everything is kind of still in motion right now. Do you have a sense that the speaker has a couple different contingencies mapped out and he's, he's looking at a longer game than the, the rest of us can see now? Or <laughs> The speaker always has a... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a, a end game. Yeah. So we'll just see. And, and the governor. Does he brief you on it? or No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but the governor uh, has his team, too, of uh, experts and, and people that ha are working on his behalf on what he thinks each budget for each department should be. So, like, for instance, for education, we'll have a line item that says last year's budget, governor's budget, and then um, what's actual, you know, what would be the actual amount you can go over. So it's, it's a process. Yeah, it's a process. Yes. Um, I don't want to, like, stay on the issue too much, but mm -hmm. we had a conference here last week for university students. Um, it was a, kind of a big thing we talked about, of, like the future of the state and whether we're going to stay or not, basically. Mm -hmm. um, we want you to stay, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we all do, too. Um, so, like, on the, on the pension issue, I guess, um, I, I'm not super knowledgeable on the subject. I know it's super complicated, and it's probably it a, is. a loaded question. But um, I'm all for, you know, keeping the promises that were made and stuff. But is there any talk about changing the promises that are being made? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. 
for um, new members, there are some things that's happening. Um, and some of it is already at the local level in terms of how individual school districts uh, pay and what their benefit package is. Some of it is at that level. And like for the state, for instance, um, I'm in some tier that's definitely at the bottom of any tier you can think of in terms of my pension and things like that. So they did change like the structure of it, yeah, to try to improve it, yeah. So actually, yes. Actually, actually, this is, uh, it's a very good question. Yes. Being a response, <coughs> These new, this new tier mm -hmm. is starting to really impact us and our ability to recruit talented faculty mm -hmm. because they look at that tier mm -hmm. and it is not uh, particularly attractive in terms of their long-term career. Mm -hmm. They have to go to age 67 yes. uh, yeah. to benefit full retirement, and that's after uh, 30, 30, mm -hmm. 30 mm -hmm. So it's it's... And really, you know, the question I ask here, the, the, the challenge that you're dealing with mm -hmm. is what your predecessors did not do mm -hmm. in putting money aside for the pension as we went. Mm -hmm. And so now we're in this real mess, but we don't, we shouldn't take it out on the retirees. It's not exactly. the retirees that, that, that made the mistake, it's that the state legislators and the governors didn't put the money aside. On the, uh, just as devil's advocate on this issue, because I have this with my friends all the time. On the other hand, we, as other people were employed, paid the same amount mm -hmm. in Social Security. And on the time that we have friends that retired at 50, 55, we had to work until mm -hmm. 65 or 67 to get Social Security at half or more than the pensions. And the increases in the 10 years we've been retired average, I think, maybe $100 total a month for the last 10 years, mm. where we are the ones then paying for state and retirees who were promised, and I agree, they weren't funded. They're getting a 3% increase. They end up friends who are making more now than they did when mm -hmm. they were working. Mm -hmm. So yeah. again, it's my. I don't disagree. I have daughters that's a state trooper, so mm -hmm. I'm all for pensions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think we're asking the public who don't really appreciate mm -hmm. that this is because they look at their own situation yes. and say, why should this mm -hmm. be true? It's not true for Social Security. So I think to sell it has to be a much better job mm -hmm. than we've done. Mm -hmm. I would have been happy yeah. to have had Social Security. I would have been happy to have paid into Social Security uh, rather than the pension system I'm on. Then I wouldn't. Can you. <laughs> and the state, the state would save an enormous amount of money. Too mm -hmm. My colleague John Jackson, I think, has a question. Okay. Uh, you've heard a lot about pensions, and of course, everywhere you go, undoubtedly you do, and there's strong feelings on both yes. sides of all the solutions mm -hmm. for anything of uh, fixing any side of the pension issue. There is one, however, Bill actually I think already introduced proposal before the legislature that to me appears to be almost a no-brainer mm -hmm. and I don't quite know why there would be a lot of opposition to and that's this bill being advanced by the Illinois Municipal League mm -hmm. about all of these local governments having their own fire and commissioner boards, all of which have a local pension system. Mm -hmm. So there are hundreds mm -hmm. of those throughout Illinois because of the number of local governments mm -hmm. we have. And uh, IML is advocating all of those be consolidated under one board, uh, leave the local boards in place, but then you have a huge investment pool which can draw much better interest rates because the pool is so large instead of Carbondale with its little <coughs> bit and Murphy mm -hmm. with its little bit, none of which draws the kind of interest rate. The only opposition I can see would be some of those local boards thinking somehow or another they're going to be diminished without mm -hmm. having that control. But it saves money, it makes way more money, and to me it's very close to one that the legislature could pass without making a whole lot of enemies. Oh, okay. 
I have to. You look like those kind well. of bills, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you and your daughter for her service, too. We've been having a lot of issues with the state troopers, so, yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi. Hi. Totally different from pension, sorry. Uh huh. Totally different. So, I'm currently a law student here at SIU. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to, I, w I worked as a social worker, and I started out working over in Missouri. And then I came over to Illinois to work as a social work supervisor, and I saw like how different it was. Um, it was a it's a lot harder mm -hmm. over here. I found working with the different agencies mm -hmm. I work for a nonprofit that was funded by D. It's still funded by DHS, but the bureaucracy and how many yes. I had to jump through was very different than when I was working in Missouri. Mm -hmm. It was a lot easier for me to help my clients. Mm -hmm. When I was working in Missouri, and then, you know, I was working with people from very diverse population in Missouri. I had clients at, um, as far north as University City, um, which has a large African American yes. population, all the way down to Eureka and Pacific, which is, has a very large white population. So I had a, lots of different types of, of, of clients, but it was just so much easier to help them get the different types of services that they needed, mm -hmm. um, much more accessibility in Missouri. And I'm just curious about what kind of legislation, if any, is being worked on um, in the Illinois General Assembly to try to make things easier uh, with these uh, different agencies in Illinois, because it is very, very difficult in Illinois. Well, um, one of the things have to do with, I think, who is running the agencies and the, the makeup of the staff and, and things like that within the agencies. Um, we do have a new governor. Um, we do have some new directors in place and transitioning um, staff members as well. I have dealt with that issue with some of the military families that I represent. <laughs> Scott Air Force Base is in my district. And um, one of the issues that I've been meeting with them about is about the issues surrounding certification. So if they're coming into Illinois from in, uh, the spouse has a nursing degree or uh, some kind of doctor or so trying to uh, go through that minefield of trying to get certification and I do have legislation to address that issue as far as that streamlining that certification process. But um, I'll have to look into what other areas that we're trying to adjust or. As simple as calling um, public aid office mm -hmm. in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. There are six people who answer the phone. Mm -hmm. So you, the phone never gets, I was on, Liner literally told me, there are 79 people ahead of you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. It's a real situation. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get my client help. Right. I just never had those issues when I worked in Missouri. Mm -hmm. People to answer the phones that I could easily go in, and you might have to wait a while, but you can right. go in and get help. Mm -hmm. First thing, you know, working over here in Illinois, and I, I wanted to come back and work in my state because I was tired of paying taxes. And <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so, it was just so much more difficult. And I also took a pay cut because y'all don't pay them over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just things like that. Just as simple as not having people answer the phone when you're when calling just to try to get information. Thank you for that. So I'm going to look into all of that. Yeah, we may have some legislation to address it. I don't know, but I'll look into it. Thank Mm -hmm. I just wanted to publicly thank uh, Representative Greenwood. She is one of the reasons why I'm here. She wrote one of my letters to um, law school admissions for me. Oh. So I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And she is a great candidate. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to help her. Yeah. I'm so proud of you, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, so mine's a really easy question. <laughs> but um, so I'm an MPA grad student here. Oh. And I'm always just curious as to why people choose to go that route rather than um, choosing to go to law school. Mm -hmm. I think you said that the person who came to your school when you were younger mm -hmm. went to law school. So what really drove your decision to go MPA route rather? Well, when I um, went to it's a it's a man, uh, Mr. McNeese. 
he was working um, up at SIUE. He told me, come up there and learn about this program. I got somebody I want you to meet. And I went and met Dr. Carr, who was over the program at the time. And he was telling me about his background. And I think at the time he was like the city manager over in Hazelwood and just all the fantastic things he was doing. And I got to meet a lot of the staff that day. Everybody was so open and accessible and friendly and welcoming. And so public policy um, was something I was definitely interested in. And once I got into, I think I even went and sat in on a class of Dr. Carr's. And I was just hooked. I said, oh, yeah, I want to go through this program. So. Don't do it. Oh, <laughs> look, I have colleagues now that's in law school. Um, and I've thought about it. I just don't know how I would have a life. Yeah. So, like, you know, I have my Nick, my son, and, and doing this. So I don't know. But it's people that Thaddeus Jones, Representative Jones, just graduated from Loyola. He did it. We got Senator Jackie Collins. She's in law school at Loyola. So um, currently, and every time you see her, she's studying. So it's uh, I, I applaud you, you ladies. I applaud you too. The MPA program is the excellent program. Yeah. Well, maybe the final question, or Linda, have Well, actually, mm -hmm. mine is more of a comment than a question. Uh, having been one of those students that watched Representative Webber and Young, mm -hmm. I am immensely proud of you. Oh. The work that you're doing in Springfield. Thank you. I had the opportunity to sit in Representative Young's house as, a, as an agency director. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit about DHS, so I'll talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just seeing you and seeing a young woman take charge the way that you have, you mm -hmm. make all of us very proud. And Thank you. And to have seen you, as, as John said, walk out and talk to those young people. You were out campaigning. Mm -hmm. And to leave the campaign and come and be with those young men in East St. Louis, and to, to have them look up to you as a role model. Mm -hmm. I think that's excellent. That's the first time that we've actually taken the program home. Mm -hmm. We've done that program for 15 years here. And uh, with John's leadership, he said, let's do it in East St. Louis, Linda. Mm -hmm. So we're really glad that you were able to be there. But yeah. I know that Representative Young, there was a person between the two of you who mm -hmm. did a great job yes. as a woman in that, who had held that seat for those number of years. I know you made her. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, maybe as a final question, before we uh, came here, we had a nice visit with the chancellor, and yes. you both had a very vivid discussion of East St. Louis, and I realized many of us really don't know what East St. Louis is like, its mm -hmm. sort of trajectory. So for those of us who really don't know much about St. Louis, what, how has it changed over the years, and what are its challenges, and what are its opportunities? Right. Well, I'm going to start with our opportunities, of course. Um, we have an excellent location. Uh, we're right across from St. Louis. We're right on that riverfront um, with plenty of property that should be and could be developed, hopefully at any moment now. And uh, we just, uh, we are a city that is ripe for uh, economic development um, and for someone to come in with great ideas and to uh, kind of lead the way on some projects to get some things going there. Um, some of our challenges have been uh, some business people, uh, when they come to the city, they're not well received. Or um, there may be some challenges in the departments um, as far as knowing what to do. Um, to uh, engage a developer or to um, show the developer what the city can offer. Um, another one of our challenges has been just uh, economic growth. Um, we have a casino, Casino Queen, and the Casino Queen <coughs> makes up roughly uh, a little over half of our city's uh, revenue budget. And so when you depend so heavily on something um, to deliver revenues to your city and then the revenues from the casino are way down, it kind of creates uh, an issue. So what we need is just a person to come in and to say, this is what 
we're going to do in East St. Louis. Just one project, I always tell people. One project, Deidre, to get us off the ground. And I think once people see what we have to offer, we are a city uh, that's full of beautiful people, beautiful, many personalities, um, <laughs> and just a diverse group of people. And, uh, but we love our city, we love our community, um, and we love each other. So we just need to have someone to come in and have an idea and be able to bring it to fruition. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank and, you. Um, I think Latoya will visit for a few minutes yes. as she has to be getting back to Springfield yeah. later today. And we want to give her a little white to get thank onto you. 127. So just a little. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. That was awesome. Great job. Yeah, you did great. Thank you. <laughs>